This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. So my next guest is the first person in history to create and sustain a full-time career as a solo percussionist, performing worldwide with the greatest orchestras and artists of our times. She is a double Grammy Award winner and a BAFTA nominee and has commissioned over 200 new works for solo percussion and has recorded over 40 CDs. She is the first percussionist to be awarded the Dame Commander of the British Empire and the youngest person ever to be elected to the PAS Hall of Fame. As a profoundly deaf musician and role model, her significance transcends the discipline of music. Her unique skills as expert listener and sound creator have driven progress and innovation in a wide array of contexts on a global scale. She is on a lifelong mission to teach the world to listen. And in 2023, she founded the Evelyn Glennie Foundation, which aims to improve communication and social cohesion by encouraging everyone to discover new ways of listening in order to inspire, create, and engage and empower. I am so, so very thrilled and honored to have her here with me today on Stop Time. And without further ado, would like to introduce you to my next guest, Dame Evelyn Glennie. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. It is brilliant to have you here. Where are you calling in from? Well, I'm at my office in Cambridgeshire in England. Okay. And is that home base for you? This is where everything happens. This is the home base. And uh, and yes, I've been here for uh, a number of years, which has, is a really convenient area to uh, work from and to travel from. So, uh, so yes, everything happens here. <laughs> You're in the room where it happens, so to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. In the engine. <laughs> Absolutely. That's wonderful. And are you, you're in the countryside, I'm guessing, yes? Well, I live in the countryside and the office here is based in a a small town uh, nearby to where I live. And um, so, yes, and the the team is just busy around the building. So it's it's lovely. Wonderful. Wonderful. What are you getting ready for right now? Have you got something coming up? Well, there's always uh, something coming up where obviously... um, knee deep in foundation activities. It is a very young foundation. And so we're still putting the nuts and bolts together. Um, And then uh, in the next day or two, I head up to Scotland because I'm chancellor of Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. And so it's their winter graduations. And uh, and that's always a very exciting time for a, a great number of students. Um, and I certainly know what that feels like, having gone through the process myself. So, um, and it's just a, a, again a, an opportunity to kind of cement the power and partnerships through listening and to uh, engage with that. Um, and then leading up to Christmas, and just sort of little bits and pieces. And actually, we have a wonderful online session with a school in California, uh, a little primary school in California. And so um, I'll be taking out some of the weird and wonderful instruments for them. (laughs) Wonderful. In my research, I watched you um, years ago, I think it was on Sesame Street. I so enjoyed that. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That was a fun day. (laughs) (laughs) It's I mean, that's where it all begins, right? With the children, where they're just so open. It, it absolutely does. And and I mean, they're the greatest improvisers we have, the, um, the most curious people, you know, most upfront, most kind of elastic minded uh, folks that we have. And it's just so wonderful, you know, when you observe and when you interact with kids, you never know quite what's coming. And uh, and that keeps us on our toes, I think, as adults. Um, but it is keeping that kind of curiosity and um elasticity in the thinking and in the imagination that I'm really keen uh, to to acknowledge and and allow the kids to 
forever explore and to keep that as a major trait throughout their life. And no matter what landscape or profession you find yourself in, there is a form of creativity there. And, you know, I often think about my own journey um, and all the years I've been doing what I've been doing. And, and why is it that I wake up in the morning still wanting to do what I do? And, you know, there are lots of days whereby I don't want to practice or I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. But it, what overrides that is the sense of curiosity, is the sense of kind of peeling the next layer and seeing what might be there. Um, because you realise, you know, sort of long ago, you've realised that, well, actually, things don't always go your way. Um, or you might try really hard at something and it still doesn't quite reach the mark. But that's OK. And and I think you, you're able to put things in perspective um, the older you become. And, and, and so you can let go a lot of that thought as well. Yeah, no, amazing. That's and yeah, I hear you. And and with the, with children, they don't have any editing, which is a wonderful thing. And it's a sad thing that we, as adults, sort of teach them how to edit, and we use the word listen as you know, be quiet, basically. No, absolutely. You're 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 right there. And I think a lot of the vocabulary we use, you know, certainly when we're. Um, uh, exposing kids to learning instruments and so on, you know, from that very young age is, is you know, vocabulary can affect uh, so much of what they think, what they do. Um, and, you know, even if you're you're sort of thinking about musical vocabularies, you know, something as basic as, as dynamics, you know, F equals loud, P equals soft, and so on. Well, what does that mean, actually? What is loud in this room that I'm in today? Uh, you know, what is loud in a library? What is loud out in a, a sporting arena? You know, what is loud in a bus? What is loud in an aeroplane? And, um, you know, I think that when we can sort of build around those words, the story, you know, kind of a a, a misty soft or a, a friendly loud or a spongy loud or a, an aggressive loud or a, um, a, a fragile soft or something, then you've got a bit of emotion there. Uh, but if you're asking a child just to play softer, you know, it, 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 they usually come at it from a physical point of view, i.e. they've got to do something physically less well, something can be made softer by thinking about it. Um, and so the whole body is then engaged in the story of that dynamic. So, it, you know, that's just a little example. No, 100 percent. And you're completely speaking my language, which is why I really wanted to connect, because as a life coach, you know, we talk about our thoughts, which are just energy, right? They're energy. And then we think, talk about our context, right? Which is what you're talking about. What words we use are so important for what stories we play in our heads, you know, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I completely identify with that. You know, what soft is to Evelyn today is very different what soft to Evelyn, even in the same room, right? Because you have an internal context as well as the external things which you're considering for whatever it is you're creating. Absolutely. And 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 what's interesting, I think, is that now, of course, we're uh, connecting with uh, audiences and people digitally, uh, whereby we're trying to get our craft over it through digital means. And of course, dynamics then have a whole different dimension because they're no longer physical. Um, and I think that's really, really interesting. And it it, it changes, you know, what we do. Yeah. Um, and certainly the pandemic, you know, where suddenly we were thrust in our living rooms and kitchens and, and expected to perform, you know, was, was something that certainly in my mind didn't work for me personally. Um, and so I didn't engage with that. And I think that, you know, for, for some people, it works really well. For others like myself, it it certainly didn't. And, and it, it just something it was something that, you know, didn't give me any emotional pleasure. I had no connection with it whatsoever. So I think that it goes back to listening to, to what is it within yourself that makes you tick, that makes you function well, that makes you provide a, a level of an experience that that is is good for you because if it feels good for you normally that will be seen then and felt by the audience yep absolutely we're talking about how how we can t tap into what 
makes us what needs to be in place for us to be the most effective we can be so that we can then yeah. connect right with our values which in your case obviously is a, a large one is is expressing yourself through the music but not just to play music right it's way beyond that clearly which is brilliant i love that hey would you be willing to take us back a little bit to that moment when you were i think just 16 years old where despite all odds you were stepping into an audition right for the for the royal academy of, Mu of music in london can mm -hmm. you take us back i'm really curious about the moment and anyone that there's so much research on evelyn so my listeners please you know that you can go and find out on her website and all sorts of things um and you'll learn through our conversation what happened to her um but i do i you know anyone auditioning period for any kind of an organization like like the Royal Academy of Music, um, you know, and my listeners can identify with this. That's a big deal, um, let alone being the age you were and, and the, you know, and et cetera. So talk to me about that moment. If you can remember it, if you can sort of embody how you felt going in, what was your mission? Where were you? What was going on for you then? Can you can you tap into that? Well, I basically obviously was still at school in Scotland and uh, I was waiting for exam results to see if I could um, do the uh, degree course at the Royal Academy of Music. So I needed certain grades to uh, to do the degree course. You didn't need those exams if you were going to do the performers course. Um, but I really wanted to do the degree so that I had something to fall back on if if need be. So I just done my exams and I had to wait a few months in order to get the results of those, which is, is quite normal up there. And um, but meanwhile, I had the opportunity to audition for the Royal Academy and the Royal College of Music, both in London. And they're both equally good places to to go to. But I had no intention of ever being accepted at that time. I just thought I'd do it for the experience. And uh, because I had no idea what level I was uh, on a national scale. Um, and it was important for me to get some kind of inkling of that. And um, so I auditioned. Uh, I think the first one was the Royal Academy. And I felt the audition went as smoothly as it could. I did the best I could. Um, there's nothing more I could really have given. And um, however, uh, when the letter came from them, they decided not to accept me because of my hearing impairment. And so I was quite confused by that and a little um, frustrated and thinking, well, that's odd. You know, what about the audition itself? You know, did, did it go OK or not? So basically, <laughs> was I at the level to get in or not? And that was the key question. Mm. So uh, their concern was that a professional orchestra would not at that time have hired uh, a musician with a hearing impairment. And I said, well, I don't want to be in an orchestra. So you're creating a scenario that does not exist. And uh, I want to be a solo percussionist. And of course, this was almost like a double whammy um, for them because solo percussion on a full time basis had not existed before. So, uh, you know, the, the panel could not envisage a, a percussion recital at, at you know, the, the premier halls in, in London or something. and. Um, but I said, well, that that was my problem. I had to work out a way to to do that. Um, and so I did push about the the audition and to to get an answer whether it was good enough or not. And they said, well, actually, it was good enough. And I said, well, you you have to create a, a place then. And it was one man on the panel who kind of said to the rest of the panelists, well, hold on a second, we can't start judging people just because they're deaf, they're blind, they might have one leg, one arm, or whatever it might be. You know, if they are off the standard to get in, we must offer a place for them to get in, if there are, are enough places, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, there were places for the percussion. So he said, you know, we're on kind of dodgy waters here. And and I think we need to call this person back um, for a second edition. And if that second edition is still acceptable, we have got to let her in. We've got to offer a place. So I had to troop back from Scotland to London again and do a completely unprepared edition. So none of this uh, had any percussion playing at all. It was all done at the piano. And it was things like figure bass, transposition, looking at scores, thinking who might have composed that and why, um, 
choral reading, orchestral score reading, tra uh, transposition, I think I've said, and all sorts of things. And uh, and so once that had been done, and, and those were things that we used to do, you know, at school, so it wasn't completely horrendous. And um, and so after the edition, immediately they said you can start in September. So, of course, I was still very young, uh, but I felt completely ready to leave school. I felt completely ready to start uh, the full-time studies as a musician. And that was it. But the outcome was that it changed the landscape uh, for future uh, people who were auditioning, who happened to have various um, challenges, physical or otherwise. And um, and that all auditions were based on ability um, and what the panel felt that they could work with and improve, you know, where they could sense the uh, sense kind of uh, that feeling of improvement within the, the individual. And um, and and that was that. So once once I got in, it was a case of getting your head down, concentrating, mm. making use of the time um, and, and and working very hard indeed. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Um, I, what 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 I feel like asking you is what comes to mind is where did that clarity of vision come? When did that you, you were so clear about what you wanted? It doesn't sound like you wanted to necessarily prove anything because you didn't see yourself that way. But you did. You did want a fair opportunity, and that's right. I mean, so talk to me about where did that come from? That sort of, I guess it's agency. It's not really tenacity. What I don't know. What would you call it? I, I don't know what it is, but I think we all have it. And mm -hmm. I think that it's it's a case of the, the kind of surrounding landscape that you have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to a normal uh, secondary school, you know, in in uh, north of Aberdeen in Scotland. And and it was a school whereby they believe that every child has a story to tell. And so they're not looking for uh, every child to to score A's in, in every exam. That's not what, it, what it's about. It is literally making sure that that school provides for children and to give them opportunities. Um, so the school wants to have a really great plumber, a great chef, a great electrician, a great speaker, a great sports person, a great musician, a great artist, a great whatever it is, a great housewife, a great husband, a great wife, a great uh, housekeeper, a great cleaner, a great shopkeeper, you know, all of these things were important. So they knew that every child is good at something, is passionate about something, is curious about something. So they made sure that all departments of the school were open to all kids, no matter what their situation. Mm. So for me, as a young kid, you know, trying to find out how to negotiate uh, hearing aids, how to negotiate music and the aids, and thinking that what we hear is through the ear, um, it, they gave me that opportunity through the skill of a peripatetic teacher uh, for percussion, uh, along with a peripatetic teacher for the deaf, to really work together and to to make sure that this particular youngster, you know, was supported in every way possible. And I remember the the uh, visiting teacher for the deaf, you know, who came in. She was not musical at all. She realized that I was quite passionate about music. And she happened to see something on television at the time about an organization called the Beethoven Fund for Deaf Children. Now, she thought, oh, gosh, you know, I think I'm going to write to this fund and see if I can get advice as to how to support this young pupil that I've got, because I've got no idea whether she's going to make it in the music industry. Of course, she was coming at this from the deaf standpoint, because that was her expertise. And, um, and so she just took the chance to write a letter, a typed letter. So this was before email and so on. <laughs> It started with, this is a cry from the heart, but I've got a young pupil here who's passionate about music and wants to do music as a profession, and it goes on and on. Mm. And she then gets a reply from the organisation, and, and that kind of, you know, sort of created another a bit of the, the puzzle or another brick in the building of the journey, really, or the road or however you want to 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 call it. And and um, so, again, you know, a journey doesn't happen in isolation. It, it's it's keeping your antennae open, 
um, you know, just asking, well, what if? So that teacher just said to herself, well, I've, I've seen this organization. What if I write to them? Who knows? It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. And that just keeps going for the rest of your journey. You know, my my particular, you know, career has just been built on that. You know, it's peeling the next layer, opening the next door, you know, peeping around the next corner, just seeing what might be there. Yeah. Why not? Right. Why not? Absolutely. Exactly that. And that's what kids do so well, naturally. Um, and that's what we want to keep going. <laughs> it's true. And as I said that out loud and thought about in the context of children, you know, when, when we reprimand them, they're always, well, well why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We always have a quick answer and a reason, you know, based on talk about, you know, <laughs> perpetuating <laughs> limiting beliefs. My God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you have children yourself? No, I don't. No. You don't. Okay. And uh, it, well, exactly, you have all your instruments, I'm sure, are your children to a big extent. They're, they're, they need a lot of looking after. <laughs> they can be temperamental and they can go their own way. Yeah. No, no doubt. No doubt. There's I'm curious, have you ever or have you stayed in communication with that that woman that wrote that letter? No, not at all, actually. No. I And I don't know where she is now. Um, uh, and or indeed if she is still around um but certainly the the founder of the beethoven fund and rachlan um who very sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago um we kept in touch really since that very very beginning mm. uh stage so as soon as i met them after that letter was written uh we kept in touch um for for all the years thereafter oh lovely isn't that isn't that wonderful right to sort of keep yeah. those those threads oh, absolutely yeah and it's it's another example i think of you know it's certainly in Anne's case digesting her legacy and and you know what she had done um and what she was still so determined to do and so um certainly through my foundation i want to keep her legacy alive i want to really draw upon that um, I draw upon a lot of the things that she embarked on and she said and the interactions that we had. There's a lot of inspiration for me. And and, and I certainly use that as a springboard a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. I often ask my guests, you know, if you could go back and, you know, talk to your younger self and tell them something that, you know, based on what you know now, maybe what what they would have liked to have heard. When When, when I think about you and asking you that question, I think, Maybe that maybe it's the other way around. My instinct tells me that you're very in the moment. Then, I mean, my my thing is called right being in the moment. I, I get the sense that you are so in each moment that it's not attached particularly to any any sort of outcome other than what happens in the moment. And that you're, yeah, talk to me. <laughs> She's not. Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right there. Actually, I think it's it, because, and I don't know why that is. It might be because you know, as a musician, when you perform live you know, that is the most important moment, Yeah, you know, that you're dealing with. And I think when you spread that out, you know, the person in front of you is the most important person. So at this point in time, you're the most important person in my life, because that is what, you know, whom I'm I, I, talking with, communicating with, addressing, you name it. And, and so, I mean, can you imagine our conversation if I was, you know, had my mobile phone sort of here right next to me, and I'm kind of, looking at my mobile phone as I'm chatting to you and and you know my head is sort of moving here there and everywhere I mean that would be highly distracting and you would know that the focus is not really on this conversation so and I think with music you're you're you know always dealing with that moment even even in a practice session um you know I think that's why it's sometimes detrimental to encourage young musicians when they're starting out you know you must practice for hours and hours mm. um well actually you know let's think about what you can do in 10 minutes what can you do in 15 minutes what can you do in 20 minutes and then gradually people just feel the time scale that's right for them the the kind of duration that's right for them so at the moment because my life is just you know doing all sorts of bits and pieces a lot of the, the things I do are non-musical um, so they can be admin based or they can be, you know, you can be in meetings, you can be doing all sorts of things. And it's, you know, 
quite a while before you can get to mm. an instrument. So therefore, 10 minutes matters, you know, and what kind of headspace are you in in that time period and how can you make the most of that? Or it could be that I'm, you know, at a venue, but I'm not able to get a, onto the stage because of unions or or something, right. you know, or there's nobody there to switch the lights on or whatever it is. So what is it that you can do in your dressing room then, you know? And it's all of this sort of situation, especially as a percussion player, where you don't have access to the instruments as and when you want, certainly in the line of playing that I'm involved with. So you find all sorts of ways to connect with trying to improve things uh, without actually having the most obvious tools. So how can I practice without having the instruments, basically? Um, Or how can I think of things without having X, Y, or Z? So that's often the situation. Yeah, that's an expansive, really, truly an expansive way of, of growing your art, isn't it? Because you know, it would be easy to fall into the mindset of, you know, feeling that those lower frequencies of what do you mean I can't get on the stage right now? And what, you know, what, I, why, you know, oh, I can't practice in my hotel room. So, you know, and then, and then a lot of energy and, and fear starts coming in where, whereas, as you're saying is, no, I just get curious, you know, you take it as it is. This is true. Yes, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, the, every situation is different, and 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 yes, and it just kind of helps you deal with the moment in time. And, yeah. and some things are out of your control, and and that's that. You know, and and other things you can maybe influence a wee bit more. Uh, and 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 it is again, that's a kind of a form of listening. It really is. Um, so everything is a give and take. Yep, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I wanted to ask you. I want to ask you a lot of things. What should I ask you? What's the hardest thing you've ever done? Oh. Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I've if I really thought about that. Um, I, I don't know what the hardest thing. It, it depends whether you can, can sometimes confuse the hardest thing by the outcome. And and think then that it, oh that was really hard because maybe the outcome didn't kind of uh, uh, you know come to the 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 conclusion that perhaps you wanted it to. Um, I, I mean I've played some pretty hard pieces of music that have been a real kind of struggle practicing, um, and again that's that can be a challenge that you find ways to get around, and mm. and uh, so that that happens, but that. You know that can happen quite a lot, actually. So I'm, I'm quite used to that, um, and I see it more as a challenge than something that is hard. Uh, that's a really interesting question, and I, I, I'm not sure if I have a, an actual answer. I mean, there can be things that have cropped up whereby I thought, "Oh, I could never do that," and and actually, when you're pushed to it, you just do do it. Um, mm. And it could be a simple thing like. Um, I remember, you know, when I started out as a young player and, and I was just sort of playing the pieces on, on stage and somebody, somebody said, well, you need to kind of speak to the audience, you know, and it sounds so normal now. But uh, and I said, oh, gosh, no, I don't I wouldn't know what to say. You know, I just would stand there and then nothing would come out of my my mouth. <laughs> and they said, no, no, just give it a go. And but I, I can't say. I kind of put that into the category of being hard. Mm. It was just, oh, that's out of my comfort zone. And it kind of very flippantly saying, oh, no, I don't think I can do that. And it's easy for anybody to say that. You know, we often say that, um, oh, I can't swim or, oh, I could never dance or, oh, I could never play the bassoon or something. Well, of course you could, yeah. you know, yeah. um, if you have the 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 physique too mm. and the kind of support um, you know, I'm five foot two and there are, you know, I'm never going to be a six foot model. You know, it, it's not going to happen. So that's that. So you, you only have what you have in order to, to work with. And, and, and that's that. So I, I might need to consider your question a wee bit longer. <laughs> I, I love that. I'm, and I love that. Um, it's always so interesting to, um, when people are pon- truly pondering something, to know where they go to look for the answer. Where was your first, where did you first go when, when you received the question? 
to look for the answer? And um, well, I don't know. I think that's. I mean, there's obviously the obvious place, such as a hard piece of music. Mm. Um, you know that that you um, had to find a way to enjoy. Um, that was the, the the kind of immediate place and and the most obvious place. Um, but you know, I've been in a situation musically whereby I simply thought I was not the right person for this particular repertoire and i nearly went back to the the group and the composer to say you know what i'm not quite sure if i'm the right person here uh, but actually i just kind of spent another day or two reflecting on it and and persevering and bit by bit by bit slowly but surely you know i just kept myself going with it and and although it took ages to engage emotionally with the music um now after you know a few years and a few recordings and a few performances it's i find it very satisfyingly challenging you know and i know that i'm not going to get the emotional input immediately as i do with a lot of other repertoire um and i know it's going to be a hard slog and i know there are certain hoops that have to be gone through mm. uh, but that's my choice yeah no, that's really interesting. And I'm, you know, if we were talking longer, I I dig in with I wonder if the difficulty was not actually in the piece, but with uh, coming to terms with how you felt about the piece, right? Not I don't think there's ever a question that there's something that you can't do probably musically. I think it's pretty fair to say that if you put your mind to it. But the right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think so. I mean, I think but I think it's also um, the feeling of what feels right at this point in time. Mm. And I'm not saying that everything should um, feel easy mm -mm. and because it, it's really healthy to be out of your comfort zone. And it's just kind of registering, right, are you willing to be in that position? And uh, in this particular case, I felt give yourself another chance with this. And um, and and so the, the rewards have kind of come. Um, and again, you know, this just goes back to listening. It it really does. It really, really does. And I can't emphasize that enough. Mm. Um, and and it, we're all different there, you know. Yeah. And it's it's so true because you have options of what to listen to as well, right? Just as we talked about with the children, they're open to listening to everything. We want them to focus and listen to us or, you know, listen to the message. And what yours and when when we encounter that kind of um experience that you did, you know, there was you, it sounds like you were confronted with one way of listening, and that kind of stopped you for a moment, going, Oh, you know, maybe I can't do this. But then when you opened up to it and got more curious, you realized, no, no, there's other ways of hearing this, um, hearing my voice in my head, right? Yeah, I think that it's it's finding the entry points that mm. are um uh that are perhaps not the obvious entry points and yeah. and I think that's that's always fascinated me because that that's what happened when I was at school uh, with my peripatetic percussion teacher you know there was uh, you know it, it you just didn't enter things in the most obvious way so the very fact that we were playing you know a Bach violin perquita on the snare drum for example you know that that's uh not your usual entry point in in learning how to play a snare drum and uh or being asked to to um you know present the feel of a tractor as opposed to the sound of a tractor that's mm. not a normal entry point and it's great because then that you're on the road then to to something that is is um just full of curiosity which is yeah. is wonderful yeah that's brilliant um what oh well i suppose i should ask you <laughs> what's the easiest thing you've ever done oh um i don't know i <laughs> these things at all um oh i've i've got no idea i i think probably the well i'm not sure if it's the easiest i've i've got no idea but um <laughs> i think what i found pretty easy was uh making the decision to be a solo percussionist um i mean there was just no no debate about that uh once the decision to be a musician had been made um mm. then the decision to be a solo percussionist um was was absolutely as easy as pie yeah. um there was just no no 
kind of other consideration there. So I think that was pretty easy, easy yep. to make. Yeah, no, that makes sense. If there were three words that you could use to describe yourself, three adjectives, what would they be? Oh, crumbs, you're really asking some uh, questions here. Um, I know you're a deep thinker. I know you can handle them. <laughs> oh, well, well, I don't know. But I, I don't really I kind of think about myself that much. But um, uh, I, I, I've got no idea. I think probably, I think I, I'm determined. Um, I'm uh, curious for sure. Um, and uh, I oh, I don't know. I'm 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 looking for help here. Um, kind. Kind. Yes. Oh, I'm I'm just looking at Emma here. I I don't know. Oh, you are kind. Am I? Yes. Calm. They said kind. <laughs> well, what's really interesting is Calm. if. I... <laughs> oh, thank you, Bones. Oh, See, this is fun. Well, it's it's interesting because I bet I bet if I asked you first, what are three adjectives that others might describe you as would that be easier for you to know how you're perceived maybe not i'm just curious yeah, I, I, I i think i'd dive under the table uh, <laughs> that's amazing that's yeah. super cool yeah yeah I don't again know. i'm just curious you know I, I i totally vibe with you on the uh the curiosity thing i'm not you know attached yeah. to it's just so interesting you never know what might turn up um <laughs> <laughs> what what is your what what is your definition of living in the moment? Do you actually sort of have one, or do you just do it? I know you're good at it. I can tell you that they're very good at it. Um, well, I I I'm not sure if I have a definition mm. other than, than um I know that this word is is coming up time and time and time again in our conversation. But but listen, I think is is such an important word because I I think it is that connector even in the heat of a debate or um in you know the heat of an argument or the heat of frustration or the heat of celebration um or happiness or any kind of emotion possible it you know listening to that here and now and and that emotion happening in the here and now is is what we remember you know that's in a way what we feel as as being memories um you know it's not often the thing that was uh, you know given to us you know th that that object or something it's it's kind of mm. the feeling of receiving that object or you know what did that make it feel like or what did it feel like to give that to somebody or or whatever it is you know um I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking across at Emma, but Emma gave me last Christmas a, a very lovely little candle. And uh, now a candle, you know, there's candles all over the world and mm -hmm. people give candles to people on all different kinds of occasions. But so that was very nice. Thank you very much. It's a really nice candle. But it's the feeling of what that candle does. So when I pop the candle on in the studio at home, you know, as we're maybe doing a recording or something like that, and this kind of smell wafts, you know, in the room. It's a kind of feeling that is ignited with the candle. So although it's an object and you say thank you, it's then the the kind of how this spreads, you know. So that's that's a a, a, a kind of simple definition um of I think you know how we can ignite our own um memories in in uh in in what we're given or what we give or or something so it it kind of gets away from being entirely materialistic and feeling oh crumbs we have to have something before we feel happy you know mm -hmm. we can we can really be happy with ourselves with with not a lot and you know you can find something you know, as you go out for a walk and and it gives you a feeling. So it's yeah. listening to that feeling. It's acknowledging that feeling. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's sort of stripping out a lot of, of what we feel we, we need to have. We mm. don't need to have so much. Mm. 
100%. No, I hear you. And it's it's where gratitude lives, right? I mean, you can't really be in gratitude or listening, which which go together, unless you're in the moment, can you? I mean, you can't really listen unless you're in the you're focused on the moment. Yeah, true. And 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 I think with listening, I mean, it does need reflection without mm-hmm. a doubt. So you can and and I do it myself. I know I do it myself. And I mm-hmm. kind of have to, you know, where I sometimes jump in or I make assumptions or yeah. I might kind of um almost finish somebody's sentence or <laughs> I might just um have an a you know, a kind of snap feeling or or whatever. And and then I just think to myself, oh, oh you know, um, there you go just just step back a little bit here and and yeah. and give you know, time and space uh, a chance to be felt really yeah something that i write about a lot and that i really identify with is what i what i call the places where there are spaces and you know as a as a fellow artist i'm a tap dancer um i'm a dancer i do all sorts of things but i identify quite quite strongly as a tap dancer and um you know i've always thought about how important those those places where there are spaces are they, i feel like that's what you're talking about you know that you cannot have unless you have yin and yang you know you you need what happens in between that's where life is i used to always say when i was teaching the dance you know it was it's you can learn all the technique and that's important but the dancing happens in between right it's in the it's in the essence yeah. absolutely it is and and yes we often talk about the 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 notes you know in between the mm. space in between the yeah. and that's what resonance really is yep um you know that's kind of where the the body language of sound comes in you know it, it's um it's the equivalent of speaking like a computer uh with no inflection no um, variation and dynamics or accents and mm. no full stops or commas and things like that. Mm. Um, and, and, and likewise, you know, with, with music, it needs that resonance. It needs the space. Um, it needs the acknowledgement of the acoustics um, in the room and it goes on and on and on. And that's yeah. really what, what the, the, the kind of um, sort of, well, yeah, the body language of the sound is and that's then where the story comes into play because we all have different body languages. You know, we all um, have our own quirky ways of doing things and moving and the pace of our walking or the the how we smile or how we move our heads and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And that's exactly the same with, with sound and how we negotiate sound. Yeah. And the coolest thing about sound is that, well, you can't really see it, or at least not at first sight, you can't see it, right? Absolutely. And I think that's the uniqueness, you know, of sound. So you give a concert and people can't walk away with it. Having said that, of course, now with um, everyone having their phones and and being able to to, uh, you know, very often uh, video things and and have snippets of this and that, I, I think it is really changing the way we listen and the way we engage with things and the depth of that, uh, because it's then no longer a physical thing. Um, and it's a, a memory that has been uh, kind of um, frozen and been frozen in time. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it it makes the 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 mind a tad lazy, you know, yeah. because you can always just switch your phone on or whatever device um, and and remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, there are um, certain advantages to that in certain situations. But I think the depth of memory and reflecting. And having your own space to do that um, really keeps that story alive. It really, you know, builds on the feeling and it will change that feeling as you go through your life. And you then have a much better perspective as regards to where it sits in history. Mm. Um, And I think that's so incredibly, so incredibly important. I mean, for example, here, um, this is where we house the Evelyn Glenny collection, which is part of the foundation, the Evelyn Glenny Foundation. And, you know, you see um, the kind of trajectory of correspondence from handwritten letters to typewriter type letters to then faxes <laughs> to emails. And you can see how vocabulary has changed. Mm. how you've gone from handwriting to a typewriter to then email 
um, you can see how sentences suddenly become much more clipped and short when email comes into play. Um, you know, mm. how there's less kind of respect in saying dear so and so, um, best wishes or kindest regards as you might do at the end of a letter or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, it, it's none of that really um, to such an extent exists in the way that we communicate now. Um, and again, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, but when I look back at the letters, I can feel the occasion. Mm -hmm. I can feel the person. I can feel that conversation. You know, it, it's it's a completely different feeling than when I read an email. Yep. You know, I yep. just see all emails as kind of this long list of emails in your inbox without any personality when I see all these addresses, yeah. you know. Oh, and it's yeah. a completely different kind of sensation. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how society is in 100 years' time, 200 years' time, 500 years' time, um, to see how we'll all be communicating. Yeah, that's that's really, really fascinating. And it's a really interesting way of looking at it. And it's so cool that you have that, that you can actually, you know, sort of see how it's changed. It's amazing, isn't it? Because resonance, as we were saying, is is in the receiving as well. So if we're if we're yeah. so quick, I mean it's like it's like jamming with somebody who jumps on your toes, right? <laughs> or doesn't hear what you yes. said in order to respond and and we're missing all that in our in our in our rush of our, of our lives just to do things quickly. So there's never any moment to embody anything. Absolutely. Yes indeed. And and you know again sort of referring to um, the foundation and the collection and its, its mission to teach the world to listen is is so incredibly important because that taps into all different landscapes from medicine to sport to uh, music, entertainment to education to religion to business. You name it. You yeah. know the, the the kind of spine of what we do is listening and and most of the issues that we have and the challenges that we have are to do with listening. Yep. You know. Um, whether domestically or, or work-wise. And so it is quite fascinating. I mean, last night we had uh, two groups of scouts in to look at the collection and see some <laughs> of the, the, the instruments and so on. And, you know, these are, you know, young sort of teenagers, you know, you're looking at 13, 14 years old or so. And, uh, and, and it's just fascinating for them to be in front of a great big tam-tam, mm. you know, holding that great massive woolly mallet, you know, and there they are striking the tam-tam and just feeling that mallet on the tam-tam and waiting however long it takes to uh, for that sound to disappear and mm. for them to just be standing there, allowing the sound to seep through their bodies. And, you know, one of the instruments, you know, I, we were just sort of playing and immediately one of them said, my God, I can feel that through the floor. Now, you know, you wouldn't normally get a 14 year old or 13 year old, you know, saying that they might say, oh, that's an interesting sound or, oh, I haven't heard that sound before. But the very first thing they said, wow, I feel that through the floor mm. is, is interesting, you know, and that's what we're asking them to, to just be aware of, that they have the opportunity to open their bodies up like a huge ear. And with that might give them some patience when they have a conversation or before they reply to an email, just thinking, aha, you know what, I'm going to create some resonance here before I just jump in and reply to that. I'm just going to reflect, reflect on that. Or, oh, you know what, I'm going to give myself a, five minutes longer just to digest this math mm -hmm. problem or whatever it is, um, rather than getting into a state of frustration or feeling they've got to immediately go on YouTube to to, to work out a, a short route to it or, or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, the work I do as a coach is people say to me, what do you do? And you go, I, I listen and I ask questions. And they go, what do you mean you listen and you ask questions? I listen and ask questions. Well, how does that work? And I say to them, I, I listen not to what they're telling me, but to what they're telling themselves. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's where the questions come from. And it's amazing because, because people are not listened to, nor do they listen to themselves. I mean, they listen to themselves in one way, right? The, the dominant well, default. Yeah, I think it's a really, um, it's kind of a necessary and a very precious 
activity that we can all involve ourselves in is listening to our own self-talk, yep. um, our, own, our own conversation. It's a bit like putting your own life mask uh, on first on an aeroplane or something before mm -hmm. you help your your uh, fellow passenger. And and at first, I you know when that sort of um, was shown, I, I thought, well, well, that's a, a bit selfish. You know, you you need to make sure that your next door neighbour has got their mask on, and then you get yours on. And then I sort of I thought to myself, well, actually, you no, know, it does make sense that you put your <laughs> own one first because if you're not breathing, you're no use to your fellow passenger. So there you go. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, I could speak to you all day. I would love to speak to you all day, but I know I can't. I know you're busy. So let me ask you this. Um, oh, well, how do you recharge? Is that something that you feel that you need? Or, you know, how do you how do you dynamically sort of um, you know, get through your day for that matter? How do you recharge? How do you replenish yourself? Um, yes, I mean, I'm not the best at taking holidays by any means, but um, you know, I, I think that uh um <laughs> Emma's laughing. <laughs> I do like my own time, I will say, and and that is possible to do because I I do live on my own and I enjoy living on my own, but at the same time I like to connect with people, which is why it it, it works really well with the setup that we have. So, you know, I'm not a recluse or anything, but I do enjoy um uh kind of having that space and of course a lot of the the work I do especially when you're practicing and and traveling around it's often done by yourself mm. on on your own and so I'm so I'm used to that scenario um but I think it is important to to just have your own time your own space and and that is often as good as a holiday you know it 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 can be just a simple simple things like going out for a walk you know or going out for a cycle or um you know i enjoy going to antique stores and and fairs and that type of thing and that's a release that's just you know something that i like to do i, I think for me what would be more stressful is packing a suitcase getting on a plane going to a beach or something mm -hmm. you know i don't want to live out of a suitcase when that is sometimes what you have to do in your work so that to me it doesn't make sense but that's just me um for yeah. other people it, it could be absolutely the thing that they enjoy and want to do so i think it's each one to their own really yeah no absolutely i hear you i mean in those micro moments right where you can just sort of go off and take a breath and take a walk i mean that's enough right sometimes i mean just i mean yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, um, if there was one highlight and one low light in your career so far, what, what, what would those be? I think a highlight, an overall highlight, would be the fact that solo percussion does not have to be talked about, whereby it's an unusual thing. It is a normal thing now, and it's a thing whereby young players are embarking on without being seen as unusual or anything like that. So there's the repertoire there to start the career of a solo percussion player. And that was an important part of my aim, was to make sure that uh, a player did not have to wait X amount of years before enough repertoire um, was was there in order to sustain a career. And it's important to use that word, to sustain a career. And so there's definitely repertoire out there for that to happen. And of course, we all have to participate in the commissioning process still. Um, but nevertheless, it's absolutely possible for uh, a young player, if that is their mission and passion, to start immediately a career as a solo percussion player. So I think that's the overall high, actually. There have been many... Um, performance situations that have been very exciting. Of course, there are um, probably the most, um, uh, you know, recent one I would I would say would be, and, and even that is, is you know, back in, in um, 2012 was the London op opening ceremony of the Olympics. Mm. I mean, that was a, an incredible high, more for the country. And, mm. and um, again, it's sort of zooming out of the situation. That was an amazing, an amazing event. Um, and it changed a lot of people's lives, actually. 
So that was definitely a high point. But as I say, the overall high is is making sure that, that and 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 showing that the sustainability of a solo percussion career um, has been possible. Um, the low points, I mean, they're kind of more for and fiddly and and whatever. You know, there's never been such a low point where you felt I'm going to pack it in. Mm. So there's never been that kind of low. There's been frustratingly. Uh, there's been frustrating moments that have got you down a bit or or haven't quite gone your way, but um, they've never been enough to kind of tip the cart where you think, you know what, I've just kind of had it now. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm kind of grateful for that. Uh, but as we've kind of talked about all along, you just take each day as it as it comes obviously yeah. you have your aims and and visions and all of that but ultimately it's a here and now that you're you're having to address and deal with and and acknowledge so that's mm. that's the situation yeah no that makes sense you know you've built already such a a legacy and i know that you have a long way to go um you know i read somewhere about yes what is what am i going to do for the next 20 years you know or 30 years and i'm curious to know what what does that look like for you like what do you want your your sort of 30 years, 20 years from now? Well, I, I I think that everything that's happening now can can continue to develop. It, it needs to develop more. I think obviously as a player, uh, which is very physical, um, you know that that's not going to go on forever. Um, there will be a time when you think, you know what, I'm I'm ready to to hang the sticks up. And and again, that's a natural progression. Um and it's that's a, uh, again a form of listening and an important form of listening, um, and that will have to be addressed at some point. Um, but certainly, the work of the foundation and the uh, ongoing development of the collection is hugely important to me. And they both must sustain even when I'm not around. So it can't just be dependent on me. And so that's really what we're working towards. And, uh, you know, making sure that the collection is always added to, that it's always a living collection, um, that uh, it's curated well, um, that it continues uh, to uh, to enlarge in its instrument collection, its musical scores, its its books about uh, percussion, its books about deafness. Um, it's, it's all sorts of things, you know. Um, and so we very, you know, are always excited to, receive donations or any instruments and things like that and to make sure that we have the provenance and make sure that they are exposed to the public. So our next step there is to get the funding for a database so that people can access the, mm. the collection from all over the world. And um, and what's important about it is that it tells a story. So, you know, when it comes to the instruments, we're not interested in saying, oh, here's a marimba and it comes from X, Y or Z. Mm -hmm. We want to know what is the story of that marimba? Mm. What is the story of that cymbal or that snare drum or that conga and how it relates to the whole journey of what the collection uh, uh, acknowledges, really? So. Mm. It's also open for research. So we encourage students to come here and use it for research. So an example is that one lady did her PhD here using the collection, and she's now um, gone on to write a book which will be published next year, um, whereby the collection was a, a huge resource um, for her with the book. So we're keen for that because it touches on uh, social aspects. It touches on gender. It, it touches on um, instrument manufacturing. It touches on repertoire. It touches on geography. Um, it touches on all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Obviously, my relationship with charities and organizations, it touches with the um, development of, of sound and deafness. Um, it touches on an awful lot than what you think is the obvious thing, i.e. percussion. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And I will absolutely put all sorts of links in the show notes for anyone that wants to get involved. Uh, there's so many different ways to get involved. That's wonderful. Thank you. It's really, truly amazing. Um, quick question. <laughs> quick question. This is not a quick question. Well, maybe it is for you. What's what's something that you might do if there were if music did not exist in the world for God forbid, whatever reason? What would you do? <laughs> Uh, have some peace and quiet. <laughs> no, Good answer. I, I think. Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I would. I, I, I do like animals, and um, 
and of course, having been brought up with animals on the farm, I, I think I, you know, I'm always uh, sort of intrigued what it might, might be like to uh, work with animals in some some way. I don't have the brain to be a vet or anything like that. I just mean, and you're training animals or um, you know, supporting animals for deaf people or blind people, um, animals, you know, being trained to go in prisons. Um, you know, dogs and cats and things like that, or um, looking after animals in some sort of way. But I, I like the, the the feeling of of training them um, so that they can kind of be an extension to uh, to our 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 ways of of living. You know, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, probably something to do with animals. I suspect that's cool. You make jewel jewelry too, right? I read somewhere. Yeah, used to. Yeah, it's something okay. that we've kind of shelved now, really, um, partly because of time. But yes, mm. I, I love jewellery and and uh, always have done. Um, my mother's side was Arcadian, and um, and they had a particular style of jewellery and do have a, a particular style of jewellery in, in Orkney, in the Orkney Islands, which are just right at the north of the mainland of Scotland. Mm. And uh, and I remember being so intrigued by that as a little girl when we used to visit relatives there, and um, and it kind of started from that, and then collecting jewelry, and then as I began to travel around, you would you know pick up bits of ethnic jewelry from um, you know like Maori jewelry in New Zealand or um, Aboriginal jewelry or um, American Indian jewelry and all sorts mm. of things you know really beautiful lovely pieces and and it was just like percussion you know you're just mm. picking up instruments from everywhere and it was a, a you know same with with jewelry really mm, yeah no that's that that makes sense that's really interesting we play this little game um <laughs> and i say what makes you okay what makes you hungry curiosity <laughs> what makes you sad laziness what inspires you Seeing a team work well. Mm. What frustrates you? Laziness again. Still laziness. <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes you laugh? Making fun of myself. Mm. And what makes you angry? Laziness. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, what makes you grateful? Oh, heavens. Uh, just being alive, I think. Mm, fair enough. That kind of encompasses everything, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah it, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. What are the what are the top three things that have happened so far today? Oh, heavens. Um, the top three things um, have been having a really robust, productive meeting uh, to do with uh, foundation matters. So that was good where people could really, you know, just air things. And that was great. Another um, lovely thing that happened was uh, having a, an online session with a law and accountancy firm that had offices up and down the UK and seeing how seriously they think about inclusiveness uh, and listening uh, within their company. Uh, so that was really, really inspiring for me. I think that was that was definitely a, 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 a highlight um, for today. And another top thing is that we've had no power cuts and no um, disasters happening in the building so far. So the, <laughs> we've still got a roof over our heads. So that, that's a good thing as well. And what's something that you're looking forward to both today and then in the future? Well, I think today is is just uh, now getting home and and just having a moment to digest what's happened today. So that's mm. that's a nice thing, and you know that can be uh, a, a, a kind of healthy moment. Um, and I think in the in the future, it's really getting to the end of the year and wrapping things up for the year and uh, do, getting the priorities sorted for the new year. Um, and kind of that feeling of starting starting a fresh new year again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it is that time of year, isn't it? December already, it's crazy. Um, Evelyn, listen, I so appreciate, I so appreciate spending this time with you today. Really, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. 
thank you very much. It's, it's, it's been fun. Thank you. Yep. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> I've been speaking today with, with <laughs> I've been speaking today with Evelyn Glennie. I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks so much for listening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment. <laughs> In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.